It's time to talk about Las Vegas with Ira. Each week, Ira David Sternberg talks with the celebrities, entertainers, writers, and personalities who make Las Vegas the most exciting city in the world. And now, here's Ira. My guest is an actor, comedian, author, game show host, television personality, and singer. And he's singing, and, and what he's singing is why he's here today. John O'Hurley is a man with standards, and he'll be singing those standards. It's a 90-minute retrospective on the songs from the Great American Songbook, the Thursday, April 13th at the Italian American Club. Showtime is at 8 p.m., buffet dinner at 6.30. For ticket information, go to iacvegas.com. And for everything about John O'Hurley, you could go to johnohurley.com, but better to follow him on Twitter at I'm John O'Hurley. And John, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ira. Thank nice you. to be with you. It's a pleasure Thank having the, the world's seventh most in interesting man on the show. So I appreciate that. It is. It is. I know. And the reason I am that is because I know that on any given day, there are only six people having a better day than I am. <laughs> There's so much about your career, but I have to start off by simply, you know, it's important. What was it about the Great American Songbook that drew you to it? Was there a particular song or composer or lyricist or a combination of all of that? Well, absolutely all of it. In, in a way, all of it. But most of it was really around the songs, and I talk about this in the show, that my mother would hum. My mother was a hummer. She never sang a blessed lyric in her life. <laughs> and, and, but, so I, I grew up surrounded by the melodies of the great American songbook. Um, and I was just intoxicated with these, the, 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 um, the melodies of, the, um, uh, of that period. Uh, um, it, um, it just mesmerized me, the, the, the wonderful songs, and many of them, were the themes from the great movie musicals of our time, uh, or just movies of our time, not even musicals to, to, uh, for that matter. Uh, but Henry Mancini, um, uh, just, you know, probably Moon River is probably the most impactful song on my life, I think. It was my mother's favorite song, and for me, I thought it was the greatest song ever written. But she hummed it, she didn't sing it. That's right. You couldn't get her to sing it. No, she went. Every now and then I get a la 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 out of her. But pretty much it was always that. <laughs> but I do tell a nice but I tell a nice story in the show about the fact that because I knew it was so important to her and I knew that it was her favorite song, that when I was nine years old I learned all of the lyrics. And from my bedroom on the third floor of the house, down to the kitchen. Um, using the Radio Shack intercom that we had to connect the two, I pressed the button and uh, I said to her, I said, Mom, I want to sing something for you. And at the age of nine, I sang Moon River to her over a Radio Shack intercom. I'm impressed for two reasons. First, that you had three floors in the house. And second, I had the same exact Radio Shack intercom. So listen, that's fine. We're bonded now. <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't really to impress. It was the fact that they had uh, gone over half of the attic and stuck me up there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now the truth comes out. <laughs> you were a self-taught pianist. So how did that tie in, did it tie in with your mother's humming and the music that you grew up with? To yeah, it did. I, I just grew up with I grew up with melody, and, and so the melodies were always in my head. And so interestingly enough, I, I started off in guitar back in the, the you know, the, the day when the, you know, the British musical invasion came over the swamp. And, uh, I, you know, so I went right to guitar, but um, I broke a finger and uh, had difficulty playing the guitar. So um, I ended up switching from guitar to piano. But it was always melody driven, and so the the albums that uh, the CDs that I have out on um, uh, on the marketplace are all of my thematic compositions and uh, combined with um, uh, electronic cello. So they're very kind of Yanni esque, um, very swirling, sweeping compositions. Um, and again, on melody driven. So it uh, I, I I love I'm addicted to just great. Sweep. I want melodies. I'm that kind of Irish poet sitting on the cliff, you know, shaking his fist at uh, 
at the skies. Uh, I, I have that kind of feeling in my music that it's always about that that deep melody. I am that still getting of, over. It's, it's the sense of Puccini in all of it. Yes, that. I'm still getting over the Yanni esque uh, adjective that was. <laughs> I'm probably the first. I, I, next to Yanni's mother, I'm probably the only one that's used that word. <laughs> You've had such a varied background, and obviously I could have you on for hours, which I can't, but because of so many different things you've done over the years, Broadway, and you made your Broadway debut in 2006 in uh, a revival of Chicago. Were you in your element at that point because you grew up with all these songs from the Great American Songbook? I'm not necessarily connecting Chicago, the musical, with the Great American Songbook, but there is a melodic comparison, if you will, that there's... Well, you, you're, you're talking about two of the greatest Broadway composers, Cantor and Ebb, the two great, you know, between the music um, uh, and and the lyrics, probably the two best that ever existed on uh, on the Broadway stage. And they created, among other things, this Broadway musical called um, Chicago, which is to, to date the longest running American musical in Broadway history. Yes. And I did the lead in it for some 15 years. Um, and, and we'll continue to do it until I get it right. Um, <laughs> the reason I brought, it was, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Mark, the, the reason I, the reason I brought it the reason I brought it up the way I did was generally when I think of the Great American Songbook, I'm thinking of Gershwin, I'm thinking of Porter, etc. And Chicago is a little bit more. I don't want to use the word contemporary, but a little more modern than than those. But clearly, you were in your I, element. No, it absolutely was. Absolutely was. Was I my element? Absolutely. I love the live theater. To me, commanding a Broadway stage is the most difficult thing that an actor will ever do. And I find it to be one of the most compelling things that I can do as an actor. It's, uh, uh, I love it. I love walking on a stage at night. And it used to drive um, the director nuts. Because <laughs> I will walk across the stage for five to seven seconds and not say a single word. I will just walk. And the silence right? and the silence is what compels one to understand the notion of what stage presence is. Because if you are comfortable enough to walk across the stage, command, then you command that audience. The audience knows that you are in control. And used to drive the it used to drive the director nuts. He says, "Don't don't 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 do that." I said, "No, I have earned the right to be silent." <laughs> Great phrase. <laughs> it reminds me, in a way, of someone such as Sinatra, Frank Sinatra, who commanded the stage, and he could stand. I tell there. the best. I tell the best story about the night that I first met Sinatra. I tell you, if if you're looking for a reason to come to this show. The night that I met Sinatra is maybe the greatest story ever told between two musicians. And I sang to him at his house at the nice. wee hours of the morning. And uh, I won't I won't tell the complete story here because it's it's too funny and <laughs> too embarrassing. But I tell you. But let's go back to the idea of Sinatra walking across this. When he walked into the room that I was in out in Palm Springs, and there were 3,000 people there, and the lights, 10,000 watts of light hit him and Barbara in the corner of the room as they were walking in, and there was a sea of silence that erupted into applause. And I understood what stage presence was when I watched him walk in and take a left-hand turn around the front of the stage. And I said, it reminds me of the lions in the Kalahari, that they never had to look over their shoulder. There was no reason to. They were the king. That's that's and, uh, that, yeah. and that's and that's what and that's what Sinatra was. He was able to feel comfortable in every environment because he was the king. And it took me a while to lose to learn that, but I tell you. It was probably the greatest lesson that I ever heard was that night that he and I met. And that's, again, to hear the whole story, April 13th at the Italian American Club, where it's 90 minutes. It's not 60 minutes. It's 90 minutes of music, singing, and 
stories. And, uh, and, and only one tear. Only one tear. All right. Only one, only one tear. I keep I the tears to a minimum. I keep the tears to a minimum, but they will flow. <laughs> Excellent. I was thinking of the other kind of tear, T I E R, where you had uh, two tears <laughs> show. So but no, that's great. When you put the show together, you must have been frustrated with the abundance of music you could choose from, the abundance of songs from the Great American Songbook. How well, in the world did you do it? it, it it's it's very. I'll tell you the way this all happened. It, Michael Feinstein, who of course is the king of cabaret in, in America, and uh, called me up <clears throat> out of the blue one day in, uh, in at my home in, uh, in Beverly Hills, Journey, and he said, have you got a, a one-man show? And I said, well, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, no, I don't. Um, uh, no, I said, but I will. Yes, and by and that was on a Thursday, and by Sunday I had my own one man show. I sat down all weekend, and the thing just came right out of me. Now, what I didn't do, he said, and, and the reason for all of this was that he had a new cabaret up in San Francisco at the Hotel Nico, and he said, "I want to open. I'd like to use you to open the show up there on on a Halloween evening." I said, "You son of a bitch, are you kidding me?" <laughs> You want me to open a show on uh, Halloween evening of all places? <laughs> I said, you know, what's going to walk in the door? You know what I mean? And I was right. Now, here's what happened. I wrote the show and I had my music director in. And so for about a week, he and I just sat, you know, kind of joined at the wrist and ankles. And we put the show together and the stories together. And, and it was just really a lovely show. What I never did was to add up the running time of the show because I would have realized that we had a two hour and 20 minute show. And I was halfway through the show and I was saying to myself, I am so sick of talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, we got out, but you know, the nice thing was even two hours and 20 minutes with no intermission, people loved the show. And, and I knew that we were on to something at that point. So out of courtesy to my audiences, I, um, <laughs> I, I, I cut the show back significantly. And uh, that's, now that's it's still, uh, yeah, but that's still now, solid hour and a half. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it is. And it's, you know, the stories are good. And, and I, I, I enjoy telling the, the, the stories of my misspent youth. Yeah. <laughs> Then you, when you cut it down, certainly that was hard. But even uh, going back to the, the selection of the songs, that had to be a challenge because you're integrating it with your stories. That's part of it. And you're also choosing from great songs that have stood the test of time. It For me, it was the story was first. And the music came to support the story. And I always feel that that kind of is the way that Broadway works. You speak and you speak and speak until you can no longer speak, and then you must sing. And um, I, that's the way the construction of a, of, a, of a show tune is, the way a show works. And so for me, it was about the stories were first. I had to tell the significant stories of my life. And so um, that was the fun part. Supporting them with the music was the difficult part because I had so many great pieces of music to choose from, but something had to be done. And I, and I found that I ended up with some great music. I really did. I, I think that um, it, it's everything is very meaningful in the show. Uh, everything is lyric driven. Um, and, uh, and I think that's why it's been a success to this point. And we're now almost six or seven years into the show. I think too, that the challenge in addition to all these great songs that are part of the Great American Songbook, you had to match the song to the story, so that there's the, the, the song. Too. The songs really underscore uh, right. what I was doing. Exactly, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you had to cut it down to an hour and a half. Have you had yeah. an opportunity to bring it up again to more than two hours? Have you had no, a chance? I, that, yeah. that would be the cruelest thing I had. I had. I, I went to the Colony Hotel in Palm Beach, and that was the second performance of the show. 
And that was maybe a week or two later after I did the show in, and it was still the same link to show when I did the show in, in, in San Francisco, but it was still the same link because I didn't know how to cut it back yet. You know, I really hadn't had a, a, you know, kind of a beta test of how I cut it back. So I finished the show at two plus hours. And honest to goodness, a man walks up to me who was 92 years old at the end of the show. Again, this, this is in Palm Beach now, right? at the Colony Hotel. Where, the, the, where the average age is 92. Is 92. That was yeah. was just a slight chicken. So <laughs> it was, it was, he came up to me and said, I want to tell you something. <laughs> I'm going to give you the greatest compliment I could give. And that was, I, at no point during your show, as long as it was, felt a need to get up and go to the bathroom. <laughs> I said, well, the yeah. critics rave. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't have asked for a more stunning review than that. Absolutely. That should be as part of the blurb. It should be right, right out there on the marquee. No <laughs> need to go to the bathroom. But on your own, you still resist cut it to an hour. Resist the urge to pee. <laughs> but you, on your own, you cut it to an hour and a half, and that's definitely doable unless you have a very weak bladder. Oh, <laughs> you know, what are you going to do? But still. Yeah. How do you... But I've had some... I've had some wonderful places and, and such an, an, an odd variety of venues that I've been able to do the show in. I've done it with 65 piece orchestras. I've done it with three pieces. I did the show with just the piano. Um, and so the show always kind of fits the environment. It's a very right. intimate show because these stories are my stories. These stories are my life. And it was about me growing up with my hands on my hip at the age of three when people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And with a sense of disgust that only a three-year-old would muster, I would put my hands on my hips. I would point to the black and white TV in the corner of the room, and I would say, well, I am an actor, so that's what I'm going to be. <laughs> and so it was always about, for me, connecting the dots from the fact that I knew I was an actor. I just had to have the world recognize. And I will I tell you a do. story. Let me tell you. But I will tell you a story that's not in the show, so you okay. get a little surprised at it. Appreciate it. I, I, I should put it in the show, but it, it's, it, it, I'll give it to you instead. Well, thank when you. I was ten, when I was 10 years old, um, and again, because I knew I was an actor, I would do everything I could to watch actors. And so every night I would, um, I would steal the portable black and white television set portable because it only weighed 40 pounds <laughs> and it had the little the little antlers like that rabbit ears and I, would, and I would i would take it up to my my bedroom there on the third floor and i would i would stick it under the bed or under the covers and i would watch the johnny carson show because johnny carson was the only place where i could see real actors and watch them talk and talk to Johnny Carson. And I went, wow, wow. And, and I was amazed that every actor had a story or two or three and they could, and, and they were funny stories. And I remember one night during the commercial break with a sense of disgust again, I got out of my bed, walked around the room with my hands and my hips again. And I was about 10 years old <laughs> going, I, I don't have any stories. <laughs> what, am I, what am I going to tell Johnny Carson when I'm finally sitting in that chair? I don't have any story. Right. So, cut to. Cut um, to. Right. <laughs> First time I was on the Carson show, which was not the Carson show then. It was uh, Jay Leno had, had taken it. And it was shortly after Seinfeld ended. And so I'm in the chair, and, you know, and, and Jay was. Kind of, he was enamored by by Jay Peterman, my character on Seinfeld, right. because he just liked the way he talked. And you know, he said, just keep, you know, just keep talking, just keep talking that way. You know, just keep talking. That way. <laughs> Jay would say that. So anyway, he said, "Would you stay through the break?" Well, you know, but for anybody who's on the show, you stay through the break on on uh, on Leno or Carson, or whatever. You're you're home free and you've done well. So I said, "Of course I can. I've got nowhere else to go." So I. <laughs> I, uh, I sat there in the chair with my hands on, on the arms of the chair. Meanwhile, he and his producer are flipping through the cards, trying to figure out how they're going to accommodate me being on longer. And at one point, I'm just looking out in the audience in dead stare. 
And Jay looks over at me and he says, John, you okay? I said, Jay, I'm fine. I'm, I'm just saying hi to a 10 year old kid. <laughs> very nice. True story. Very True nice. Story. So now you I know, very few, very few times you get to, to reconnect with that little kid inside of you where you wonder what would happen if. But now I understand why when you were with your musical director, you were joined by the, I believe you said the ankles and the arms, but not the hips because the 10-year-old has the hips. <laughs> At least that's my mind figuring all that out. That's a, we'll yeah, uh, that's a great. So, had you ever thought that you would at some point be on the Tonight Show, whether it was Carson or Leonard? Oh, I knew it. Oh, oh no, I knew it. it. Oh, no, and it wasn't that. It was, and the reason I claimed, I said I was an actor, not that I wanted to be. Oh, no, you were, you already I were. I was an actor, and that was yes. at the age of three. <laughs> I would watch Romper Room, Captain <laughs> Kangaroo. Um, it, it, it didn't, uh, all of these shows, uh, back when I was a kid and I knew I knew I was supposed to be there and I could see myself there without any sense of I just knew that that's where I belonged so for me again it was about connecting the dots and where, um, but where did that confidence kind of come a, from John where did that come oh, from? oh 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 no it wasn't confidence ah. it was it was just a self knowledge I knew that, that my imagination tells me everything I need to learn in life and it always has done that. And I can't I, I can't be more emphatic about that to anybody who's listening to me right now. Not your rational mind. Your rational mind will lie to help you. But your, your imagination never lies. It knows everything about you. It, it, it is the 24-7 assessment of who you are, where you're supposed to be. I have lived my career by listening to my imagination. And that's why I, if you say I've done a lot of different things, it's because my imagination has pulled me by the back of the neck and said, here's your next step. Kidding. And I always listen to it. I've never stopped. So it's why I have such a strange, odd, prolific career, because <laughs> my imagination is strange and prolific. I, and I, I, I always thought of it as prolific. I never thought of it as strange, but you definitely but have it, does. it leads me into in, into this. I mean, dancing with the stars, game shows, uh, writing, you know, composing music, writing books, such a, I just whenever my imagination tells me to do I listen to it and I say, I trust you. And you will lead me in the And it's never, ever led me in the wrong direction. Not once. Does the show that you're doing now, and again, it's April 13th at the Italian American Club, the show that you're doing there, and you've been doing it for several years, has, it, that, has that been the most gratifying to you because it's so personal? Well, I'll tell you, at the end of the night, I... When I take my bow, I walk off stage and I go sit for a moment in my dressing room and take a sip of wine. It's one of the most complete feelings that I have felt in my career because I know I have been honest and authentic with a group of people and they have felt it. And as I say, when you can make a group of people produce one tear and at the same time laugh hysterically and at the same time be so quiet that you can hear a pin drop you cannot hear a sound in my show it is absolutely still and that's another thing that i talked about is the notion of stillness um and so i the show is one of the most satisfying things i've done because it's so intensely personal to me do you find that you add on to the show as time goes by with additional material? I get a little, I get a little long winded sometimes. <laughs> but I, I stay, no, but I, I stay within the, the, the parentheses of what the show is about. Right. I try, I try not to regard it as a a, a scripted piece. I don't like that. Um, I like the idea that some nights different words hit me. Um, uh, and, and different ways to express the same idea, the same story, um, or different observations about that moment are still there. So I, I like to keep it, as I say, more on the authentic side rather than saying, well, and then I wrote. Yeah, right, exactly. And, it, and it, it, has to be a, it has to be a challenge for you, given your career in Hollywood, that at the same time, you're striving for this authenticity 
and you succeed in the show, when people think of Hollywood as a certain way, you can't be, in many cases, authentic in Hollywood because you'll never get the career you want to get. You have to somewhat play the game. And yet, you seem to be I able to did. do both. Yes. So you, I you don't. Succeed. I mean, it's not, it's, it's not, it's, here's, I mean, you can't pick a career. A career is a set of circumstances that you stumble upon as you take the half look over your shoulder and say, look, oh my goodness, that's my career. I could never have predicted out front that I would do all of the different things that I do or did. I could never do that. I could never, I, I could never forecast all of that. They came to opportunity. And the opportunity I always listen to if I can see myself being a success. So Hollywood doesn't bother me. I'm not, I was never, a, I, I was, I've never been to an award ceremony in my life. I have hosted several. Uh, but I have never been to the war, even when I won the night of the, the, the Screen Actors Guild Awards. And the first, I never went. So I, it's not important to me. It's, it's just, uh, it, it, awards are, are not important. It's the completion of what I do. I never watched Seinfeld first run because it was theater to me. I wanted to remember it as theater. Right. A television show or a movie, that's a, an editor's medium. You do all this work and, and ends up in the hands of the of the editor, or and you know what I mean. And then they put a show together yeah. based on you know what they what the, the timing or you know the plot line or whatever they do. Well, that had nothing to do with the fact that I memorized a ten minute monologue that's now sitting on the you know the floor. Oh, right. I don't want to watch that. So it's of no importance to me. I would much rather remember it as theater, as a live, authentic event. And and so Seinfeld was always that way for me. I I never cared what it. You know, and, and I, watching it, it didn't mean anything to me. I knew, I knew, and it was funny because if it made me laugh, and I would every now and then have the corner of my mouth and go up like that, and I, and I knew a lot. I had to like you, idiot, you better, you better not. And, uh, but I mean, I knew, you know, I knew when it was funny, and and so I said, that's enough. I don't need to watch the show. And probably the most important question when they come to see you at the show. Will they get the chance to meet the ten-year-old? Oh yes, <laughs> <laughs> I never lose. I never lose that kid inside me. I really don't. I really don't. Unfortunately, I have a sixteen-year-old child who helps me <laughs> and make sure that I don't. Do you find we are all we are all just bozos on the bus, my friend? That's all. <laughs> Do you find the the traveling okay as you go from city to city and perform? Are you okay with that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I actually like it. I'm in Phoenix right now. I'll I'll be um, uh, uh, Alice Cooper and I are doing a, a concert together tomorrow night. Of all things, oh yes, John O'Hurley and Alice Cooper. Absolutely. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've been very close friends for about 20, 25 years, and so I helped him raise money for his foundation. But I mean, there's there's a non sequitur, you know. So it's <laughs> I um, love non sequiturs. It, That's okay. Uh, yeah, but it's you know I I don't mind the travel. I, really I kind of like it. I really. I'm in an airplane about 200 days a year. And so it's always, an, wherever I go is always an interesting place. Last question. What do you want people to come away after seeing you for the hour and a half and music and stories and everything that goes on? What do you want them to come away with? You know, I, I always like the notion of people walking away with the idea that, boy, that was time well spent. I love that notion of people saying, wow, I'm so glad I did that because I had no expectations when I went to the show. And all of a sudden the show just kind of hit me sideways. And for me, when I walk on stage, right before I walk on stage, I say one prayer. And that prayer is this, I say, God, let me be surprised. And that's it. And that relaxes me. And so I'm never really concerned about what's going on stage as much as I'm waiting for my surprise. I know why, I know what I'm gonna say, I just don't know why I'm gonna say it yet. Well, that's a great way to leave it. My guest has been John O'Hurley, a man with the standards, and he'll be singing those standards, a 90 minute retrospective of the songs from the Great American Songbook, Thursday, April 13th at the Italian American Club. The showtimes are at 8 p.m and a buffet dinner at 6.30. For ticket information, go to IAC Vegas.
IACVegas.com, IACVegas.com. And for everything about John O'Hurley, you could visit his website or you could follow him, which would be better, on Twitter at I'm John O'Hurley. John, thanks for being on the show. Ira, as always, thank you. Thank you. See you next time. You've been listening to Talk About Las Vegas with Ira. Each week, Ira David Sternberg talks with the celebrities, entertainers, writers, and personalities who make Las Vegas the most exciting city in the world. Hey,